Good morning, everyone. This is Penny from Wisconsin Land and Water, and I'm the Conservation Training and Membership Services Coordinator. And today our presenter is going to be Aaron Silva, and Caleb Langworthy is going to come on in a little bit after I go through some logistics and talk, tell you all about Aaron. So I'm going to be um, offering one crop management CEU. So at the end of the presentation or during the presentation, if you want to just email me and um, then I will get you signed up for one crop management CEU. And this um, training is being presented with a collaboration between Moses and Aaron and NRCS is helping out on it. And um, we get some funding th through from DATCAP and it's also provided by the State Interagency Training Committee. So I think we're good. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Caleb. If you want to unmute yourself, Caleb, and you can introduce Aaron for us. Hi, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is the first of uh, three organic webinar series for 2019. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Erin Silva from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, she's an associate professor there. She'll be presenting on building organic cover crop conservation cropping systems through crop rotations and cover crops. Uh, Dr. Silva is an assistant professor uh, at the Department of Plant Pathology at the University of Madison, Wisconsin. Her research and extension programs focus on sustainable and organic cropping systems, including cover crops and cover crop-based no-till production, and the impact of organic management on soil biological and physical properties. Her teaching responsibilities focus on topics of food, sustainability, and climate change as, and organic system health. As part of her extension program, Erin leads the Organic Grain Resource and Information Network, OGRAIN. Erin works closely with organic farmers and industry members, both in Wisconsin and across the United States and serves as a member of the Wisconsin Organic Advisory Council. In 2018, the University of Wisconsin was awarded a USDA NRCS Conservation Integration Grant for their project, Innovations in Cover Crop-Based Organic No-Till Systems to Improve so Soil Health and Nutrient Management. Dr. Silva? All right, thank you, Caleb. Um, if you can't hear me, uh, just put something in the chat box. Um, hopefully everything comes through okay on the microphone. Um, and thank you for that introduction. Like Caleb mentioned, we have a lot going on in organic research and cover crops um, and with organic no-till. And it's been um, a real, uh, just a, a real gr advantage now of having this NRCS SIG grant, which has brought in a lot of industry partnerships and collaborations with ag engineers and biosystems engineering. And we have lots of demonstrations going out of um, the roller crimper and organic no-till on organic farms in Iowa and in Wisconsin. So there'll be um, some great opportunities to, to see organic no-till and, and how it's, it's working, um, not only on our research station, and, and folks are welcome to come out there and visit for our field day on August 29th, um, but also on, on working organic farms. Um, so if you are interested, um, you know, certainly you can send me an email um, and we can get you on the O-Grain listserv, which announces the dates of, of different field days and events. Um, but today I want to talk about a, an overview of building organic conservation cropping systems through crop rotations and cover crops. And I'll, I'll talk quite a bit about organic no-till as part of this presentation, as, as that's uh, definitely been a cornerstone of my research and extension program and something that people are, are very interested in, in in terms of maximizing the conservation benefits of organic agriculture. So uh, for those of you that may not be as familiar with organic, um, the term certified organic, where the, the farm has actually gone through a specific certification process to be able to use the USDA seal and sell the product of organic, that means that the, the item has been grown according to strict uniform standards that are verified by independent state and private organizations. 
And that includes inspections of farm fields and processing facilities and detailed record keeping. And also includes a three-year transition period. Um, and more specifically, that's 36 months uh, from the application of a last prohibited substance. So depending on the farmer's inputs and their crop rotation, um, the, the uh, transition period may actually be shorter from the actual decision of a farmer to, to transition a field to the time that it actually becomes certified organic. And um, yeah, I hear stories from people about a lot of fraud in organic or that when as a consumer, you may not be purchasing what you're expecting. And as someone that's worked in the organic industry for the last 15 years, and, and in that um, as, you know, as someone that worked at a land grant university in an extension capacity, uh, you know, that's, is something I feel is is overblown. I mean, there, there's certainly in any circumstance where there's money to be made and there is an opportunity for um, you know, people to, to take advantage of the system, there are going to be certain people that try to take advantage of the system. And, and we do hear of um, cases abroad, and I believe there was a pretty high profile case in Nebraska of um, a farmer that was, was caught selling fraudulent grain. But Overall, in my experience as someone that's gone through the certification process and works closely with farmers, um, this is a, a very highly regulated system with a lot of oversight that really works. Um, you know, the farmers indeed have to keep um, many records throughout the process. The inspection process requires a full day of an inspector going out, visiting the farm, walking the fields, walking through all the records, and then there's a second level of oversight where that inspection reports to a certification specialist. So it's it's my experience that fraud is difficult and, and fraud takes work. Um, and it is definitely the exception and not the rule in organic. And where you know, there's different approaches to organic and, and different um, ways that, that a farmer can approach the transition, the farmers that, that I've worked with and the certifiers that I worked with are very committed to maintaining the organic standard, maintaining organic integrity, and and certainly um, following the regulation as it's been set out by the, the USDA National Organic Program. So I do get a bit frustrated when I hear that the uh, the, the fraud in organic is, is widespread as, as this process is quite rigorous with a lot of oversight. So this is the seal. So again, if, if a farmer is selling something, um, as organic and using the seal, it does indicate they've gone through this, this very rigorous regulatory process. They've been inspected. They indeed are, are using the inputs and the strategies that are required by the National Organic Program. Um, and a consumer can feel good about buying that, that product that it indeed has been um, produced using those specific set of standards. Um, so more specifically, what is organic agriculture? It's important to note that organic agriculture is, is really an ecological-based management system. So one of the misconceptions about organic is, is that it really, um, the main difference between organic and conventional production is what an organic farmer can use or what they can't spray. Um, and, and that really, in many cases, is secondary. What organic agriculture is speaking to is what a farmer actually does, giving the consumer um, confidence that their food is being produced in a certain way using a certain set of production principles. So it's really the production principles that are the foundation of organic, and those inputs are secondary, although certainly those are something that need to be considered during the transition um, and certainly need to be considered more broadly when designing a conservation cropping system. But I, I just want to, to note that there's a lot more to organic versus what a farmer does or does not apply. And certainly there are things that organic farmers can apply and do use. Um, so there, there is, I think, a, a bit of a, um, oh, you know, probably an overstatement that organic is pesticide free, um, because I think that's a much more nuanced statement that is often misrepresented. There are certainly pesticides that are allowed in organic, as well as fertilizers that are allowed in organic. And in fact, um, this is 
a relatively rare occurrence for us, but the timing of this season and just the challenges of this season, we're doing both no-till soybeans and corn, and particularly with no-till corn, um, we had to, this past couple of weeks, apply a pesticide to control armyworms. Um, so there is a pesticide that is available. It's um, called Entrust. It is something that is very specific to Lepidopteran pest. It's something that breaks down very quickly, but is allowable and organic, and it is a tool that organic farmers can use. Um, but we also use a lot of other tools, including crop rotation and variety selection and timing of, of planting to mitigate um, that risk and to minimize the um, the possibility of, of having to use those pesticides. Uh, so some, what are some of these practices that are required? Diversified crops, so at minimum, um, and, and just to take a little bit of a step back, a lot of the organic regulation is not necessarily entirely spelled out with a lot of specifics. The organic regulation has to apply um, not only across the U.S., but really farmers across the globe can become certified to the USDA National Organic Standard. So it has to be broad enough that it encompasses a wide range of production environments, a wide range of cropping systems, a wide range of local resources that a farmer can use. So it's not a cookbook or necessarily um, in, in a, a very defined set of regulations, but instead is very much based on principles. So there is some gray um, in various aspects of the regulation where there may not be a set number um, or there may not be um, exactly a, a defined set of standards. But again, that is to really um, address the fact that organic is is very widely applied and is supposed to take advantage of local resources and local conditions. Um, but overall, organic requires diversified crops. You can't get away with continuous corn, nor can you get away with um, a corn-soybean rotation. Typically, an inspector and a certifier is going to be looking for at least three crops in the rotation. And some of the grayness here um, can be how that is split between cash crops and cover crops in terms of what is the diversity within the cropping system. But certainly as we look at successful organic farmers and what makes organic work, this diversity is absolutely essential. The best organic farmers, the successful long-term organic farmers are going to have a high degree of diversity and I'll, I'll show you an example of that. Soil stewardship. So I know organic gets criticized about the, um, the need um, in many cases for mechanical cultivation and tillage for weed management. Um, but soil stewardship is at the foundation of organic regulations and the, the organic farmers have to um, demonstrate through a variety of means that they are maintaining and improving soil resources. Uh, that is absolutely at the heart of organic. And I'll give one example um, from what I've seen at our research station, because again, we go through the same certification process um, as, as part of the certification of our research land. So we go through an inspection every year, the inspector goes out, walks the fields, and um, honestly, we were called out, despite the fact that we definitely try to employ best management practices, that some of our fields that had a bit more of a slope um, we're at risk for surface erosion. So in response to that, to become and to maintain our certification, we had to put in a new waterway. We had to demonstrate we're using um, very aggressive cover crop practices to keep ground cover on those fields. Um, and we had to, to change our approaches to deal with this risk. Um, so the inspector is going to be looking for those risks in the field and their farmers will have um, that period between the, the their last inspection and their next inspection to address that, but there has to be demonstrated progress if indeed um, these deficiencies are found. Um, animals must have access to pasture. Um, so this includes chickens, it includes dairy cows, it includes beef cows, it includes hogs, um, but the pasture is again a cornerstone of organic agriculture. And, and definitely helps um, address that, that soil stewardship aspect that is so critical to organic. 
no antibiotic use on livestock. Um, and this is not to say that antibiotics are, um, are, are not something that an organic farmer has to think about. And I, I want to be very cautious and very clear on what I'm saying here, because this is, again, a criticism of organic, that organic farmers, because they can't use antibiotics, you're going to see sick animals that are left to suffer, um, and, and uh, that's you know, an issue in terms of animal welfare. And that, again, um, is, is something that is looked at in the inspection process. My experience um, with organic um, and being closely involved in an organic dairy farm and working with organic farmers is because of the access to pasture, um, because of, of other aspects of organic management in terms of herd size, um, feeding strategies, animals tend to be healthier and tend to have a, a longer lifespan. And this is borne out in term research. Um, so typically, they're not finding that they need a level of antibiotic use that they may find in other cropping systems um, in, in more industrial models. But if an animal truly is sick, um, that farmer has to use antibiotics, but that, that animal has to be removed from the organic herd and sold on the conventional market, or if that farm does have both conventional and organic production, which there are farms that do do that, including on the animal side of things, that animal can be moved to conventional production. So animals cannot be not treated, they cannot um, be mistreated, but those animals that may have had antibiotics cannot be, um, that, that milk or that meat cannot be sold as organic any longer. It prohibits synthetic inputs broadly. There are some exceptions that are outlined in the national list, um, and you can find both the National Organic Program Regulation and the national list on the organic um, website that's housed uh, by USDA uh, AMS. Um, but it does allow for natural inputs. So there are, like I mentioned with our example of spraying for armyworms, there are inputs that can be used both for fertility and insecticide. Not so much for weed management. They're not that they are totally disallowed. There's just not anything that's really effective, both in terms of um, their ability to truly um, inhibit or knock down weeds, nor from an economic perspective. It also prohibits the use of GMO crops. And that could be a whole other discussion of why organic has gone that way or whether or not that's a justifiable um, in terms of sustainability, but it does. Um, and certainly I'd be happy to talk about that later if, if anyone was interested. Again, the regulation allows for flexibility. It's not a cookbook, which to some extent makes it challenging through transition because there's not necessarily a defined set of production practices, but instead the management plans need to reflect unique characteristics of each operation. Uh, so another misconception that I like to correct pretty quickly when I'm talking about organic, and especially when it comes to tillage and cultivation, because I think as we look at transitioning organic farms and people being hesitant to transition to organic, uh, you know, farmers have, have really worked hard to develop no-till approaches in conventional systems. Farmers are increasingly working hard to figure out really innovative ways to integrate cover crops in this system. Um, and some of the best farmers I work with are certainly um, people in Indiana and Iowa, like Lauren Steinledge and Rick Clark, who's, who's been in the news quite a bit lately, that are doing some really, really great things, um, kind of you know, following that Gay Brown model of, of pushing the envelope when it comes to soil health. Interestingly, both of those fellows are also you know, doing some experimentation in organic too, um, seeing the, the rewards in terms of the economics of organic and how close they are with, with their other methods of soil stewardship. Um, but I think that they're also great examples um, in terms of you know, people that have been really trying to maintain and, and do no-till, um, but are really moving ahead with science and technology and highlighting that organic agriculture is, is not what was done on your grandfather's farm. And, and that's something that I, I hear from, from farmers. Oh, you know, it's going back to what my grandfather was doing when he was doing all this cultivating. Um, that's not the case. We've come so far in organic in terms of 
not only farmer experience and farmer research, but university research, and the amount of interest in um, equipment companies now, it's, it's been overwhelming in the past two to three years, the number of phone calls I get about um, equipment companies looking to invest in equipment that's specifically for no-till organic, roller crimpers, ways to, to mow or manage cover crops between rows, interseeders, and this is people that are using RTK and guidance systems, new approaches to, to tillage and cultivation that aren't moldboard plowing, that are looking at minimizing soil disturbance, that are looking at maintaining residue and cover crops. It is a very, very exciting progressive area to be in with just some amazing farmers and amazing minds in terms of um, industry and agencies. It, it, is, it is definitely not a throwback to 75 years ago um, when we didn't understand all aspects that we're trying to um, maintain and steward with respect to soil health. It is really taking what I think is um, you know, some of the best of science and technology and, and farmer innovation. Um, so instead, uh, you know, we're really looking at alternative approaches. Oftentimes it's less inputs, not always though. So it's not I get frustrated when I hear organic being synonymous with low input because it's really alternative input. Um, it often de-emphasizes individual inputs and more emphasizes the understanding of the system. When weeds are going to be germinating, when do you strategize planting, when do you strategize cultivation, um, how do you design a crop rotation, all of this um, to go around, how do I protect, how do I build my soil, and how do I um, achieve the crop yields that, that I want to um, achieve on my farm, may not always be pushing the absolute maximum yield. Organic is often looking at the long term and looking at the balance of building soil health with maintaining a productive and financially sustainable farm, economically sustainable farm, um, but not compromising our other um, ecosystem goals within that. So again, it integrates science and technology to make decisions and manage production. Um, I, I mentioned some minimum rotations for organic. Um, I'm not, because again, there's just so much to talk about in terms of designing rotations and the specific um, I guess, opportunities and ways to design rotations, I, I, I just want to highlight more that rotation is a very important strategy for maintaining soil, um, for protecting our soil, and for also um, maintaining the, the productivity of the farm. Um, and, and there's ways that we can use the rotation to not only um, minimize the amount of tillage and cultivation we do by capitalizing on the, the role of rotation to keep weed populations down, but we can look at the rotation and, and manage the rotation to, to try to create as many windows for cover cropping as, as of all possible. Um, so some of what we want to strategize with rotation, and I think this is one of the, the opportunities we have to to counteract that criticism that of all the tillage that organic does or all the cultivation that organic does and all the open um, soil that organic has is that we really need to think of the rotation and think of where we're going to put cover crops that even though we are um, doing some soil disturbance what our goals are is return as much biomass, as much carbon back into that soil, try to get as many living roots down into the soil that's going to help um, maintain the soil structure, rebuild our mycorrhizal populations, um, help maintain the, the soil biological um, communities that we're, we're striving for, um, but we're also going to allow windows for cover crops that the, the times where there is um, open soil between different um, soil disturbance events is absolutely minimal. So we're talking, you know, going in, harvesting a crop, coming right back in and putting in a cover crop. Um, so that the time that that soil is at risk is, is 
is is absolutely minimal. And one of the things, and I was actually giving um, a no-till talk at a conventional cover crop meeting in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, earlier. So, and hearing a conventional farmer, and with last year, we'll see what this year pans out to be. We've already had a very wet, challenging year, although it's been more spread out rain than those heavy rains but last year during the summer we had some really heavy rains and this this conventional farmer was um, talking about he had some hillier land and he was putting in a rye cover crop and um, that rye cover crop went in and then a couple weeks later there was a heavy rain event and he had some really good photos to demonstrate that even you know that that you know three four inches of rye growth how much that holds the soil in place and that um, you know we really can't um, I think minimize the the importance of, of getting um, even those you know, you know four to six inches of roots in the ground and um, that green growing um, cover crop to to keep the soil and maintain the soil and reduce the risk of surface erosion it was really striking the photographs he showed um, but again, the, the minimum rotation of organic tends to be corn, soybean, and all grain. And depending on the opportunities, um, if that farm is integrated with livestock or if they have an opportunity to sell hay, and increasingly there is a market for organic hay, um, and that market is doing quite well, um, our rotation is usually corn, soybeans, and winter wheat, or potentially a legume or legume grass um, hay mix thrown in there as well. And so, I mean, there's lots of opportunities for cover cropping here with corn. We're increasingly working with different interseeders. And like I was mentioning, the technology is really ramping up. We have some great trials that we're doing some interseeding. Um, and even if that um, interseeded cover crop, again, is just a few inches high underneath that corn canopy, that corn's harvested, especially if it's um, chopped as silage and that all that, um, that biomass is removed, that cover crop may be a few inches high underneath that corn canopy, but it's there, it's growing, and it's ready to take off once that corn is harvested, and it's there to protect the ground throughout the fall and the winter. Soybeans, and increasingly farmers are using cover crop-based no-till um, that eliminates the need for any soil disturbance, you know, for a good um, 24 plus month or um, 12 plus month period. So we have um, some good ground cover then. And small grains. And again, this is a great opportunity um, to do some cover crop interseeding with alfalfa or clover um, and have that as a ground cover and potentially even have that as um, an opportunity to, to move into a, a forage phase of the rotation after that. So and you can see here all the opportunities for diversity and all the opportunities for kind of jump starts on protecting the soil and maintaining cover. So this is an example of a farm. Um, and no, this is really hard to see. And I want to highlight more the colors here. And I'll try to read out for you some of the specifics. But this is a, a very, very successful organic farm in Rock County, Wisconsin. We had a field day out here with uh, Practical Farmers of Iowa last year, and, and they're an operation that does both conventional and organic. And this is an example of, of their rotation. So um, you know, each of these blocks here um, are different um, uh, fields, and you can see each of these different colors are different crops in the, the rotation um, or cropping sequence. So they easily, easily have six to um, seven different crops that they grow in a field. And that diversification is so important for weed management that's going to help minimize the amount of tillage and cultivation that needs to be done and for the maintenance of ground cover over the entire 12 month um, annual period. So for instance, on this top line here, they have, they have a spring pea. So they go in in April, they plant peas, um, they harvest, and then they actually come in after pea harvest, immediately after pea harvest, and they do um, a soil building cover crop of alfalfa. And they're doing that for the nitrogen credit, they're doing that for the soil building, and then they come in, they do sweet corn. 
And sweet corn offers a shorter crop that they can come in um, and then they can do wheat after that. So the wheat is a crop that is there all winter, um, harvest the wheat probably sometime late July and August, and then they put in a rye cover crop. Rye cover crops there through the winter and then they come in and they do field corn. Um, and then they go in and then they plant oats after that. So there is a little bit of a gap here where there may be an opportunity for a cover crop, but in most cases there's always something on the ground, highly diverse in terms of um, whether that crop's drilled or on 30 inch rows, um, whether that crop's um, you know, a summer crop or, or it's a winter annual. And that's going to allow for protection of the soil, it's going to allow for a diversity of, of types of roots in the soil, and it's going to allow for almost continuous ground cover throughout the season. Let's change my pointer here. Um, so cover crop options, um, this is again, we wanna think of the rotation. The other thing that I've been hearing from conventional farmers, and I give that example of that farmer that I heard speak in, in Fond du Lac last year is someone that's been doing this, um, but also you know, strategize not only what crops you're growing, but potentially the, the maturity that you're growing to ensure that you are able to get harvest um, soon enough Granted, this year is a whole different ball game, but harvest soon enough to allow cover crops because cover crops are just such, such an important um, part of the organic soil building strategy and using that rotation to um, maximize cover crop windows is important. But certainly, typically, if we know we're doing corn silage, great opportunities to do cover crops after that, whether it be rye or wheat, um, Again, with interseeding into silage, we could do a red clover into there and then come in and maybe um, do some, some rye into that red clover. Uh, lots of, of different opportunities here. And then after that cover crop, um, you know, go into soybeans. So there may be a couple weeks between the cover crop and the soybeans, depending on if we're doing no-till or typical organic soybeans, where we need to incorporate that cover crop. But then again, we're going right back in where then we're planting the soybeans. Um, we could take the soybeans off and then go right back. You know, we may need to do some soil disturbance. We may not, depending on how clean those soybeans were. Go in, do winter wheat. Um, we can do some uh, frost seeding of red clover into winter wheat, harvest that winter wheat, it's combine, the red clover's there ready to grow. It's there through the winter. It's a great source of nitrogen for corn silage. So we, you can just see the amount of diversity and the amount of ground cover maintenance that we're able to get by strategizing cover crops and rotations. Um, so just some of the timings, you know, winter wheat, mid-August, we're still able to either get some cover crops in or again, um, do some interseeding, even doing something like Verseem clover after winter wheat. It's gonna winter kill, but it's gonna give you some cover crop residue on the soil surface um, allow you to get in a little bit earlier in the spring, but even that residue is going to allow some protection um, during or against and early spring during for heavy rain events. Um, you know, so, so really strategizing both rotation, potentially um, you know crop maturity groups and variety selection to try to take advantage of all those windows. I just want to talk briefly um, about some of the long-term data that's demonstrating um, how organic is performing. So WIXT is the Wisconsin Integrated Cropping Systems Trial. It's the long-term trial that UW-Madison hosts at our Arlington research site. It's been going on for about 30 years, has six different cropping systems, representative of the upper Midwest, a continuous corn that is um, tilled. It's not a conservation cropping system. Corn soybean that is conservation cropping. It is strip tillage. It's not a complete no-till system. We have an organic corn, soybean, wheat rotation with a clover cover crop. And then we have some forage rotations. So one that is conventionally managed with corn and alfalfa, one that's organic managed with corn, oat and alfalfa, and one that's rotational grazing. So the two organic rotations, um, these are both going to include um, cultivation and some degree of soil disturbance for um, weed management. Um, whereas uh, the uh, conventional rotations, that would be more absent. So I just want to just highlight a, a, a few key data points that have been collected over 30 years. Um, 
One is soil carbon trends. Now, I, I think it's important to point out that Arlington is on a um, prairie derived soil, a rich mollusol. So we're starting off. We'll with... just switch over, eh? Hello? I'm not sure what's, I'm hearing some noise in the background. I'm not sure what's going on. But in terms of soil carbon trends, you can see here along the axis, we CC for continuous corn, strip till CS, and then organic uh, corn, soybean, wheat. Um, and unfortunately, um, we do see carbon loss as we see these different dots that are below the, the zero here, which would be kind of maintenance of, of uh, carbon. But what I do want to point out is that um, you know organic all if you're familiar with statistics you know that these letters um, above each of the dots mean that those numbers are if they have the same letter they're not significantly different even with the tillage and cultivation um, except for the very deep soil depths as you can see on this last set of numbers at the bottom of the graph where um, at, at, at very deep soil depth there does seem to be some gain in um, the conservation cropping system, um, but even then, it's not significantly different because they are both um, designated or C. Organic is not losing any more soil carbon um, than, uh, um, I just got to note that the audio may be down. Hopefully it's okay. Um, so organic is not losing any more soil carbon than um, any of the other systems. So I think that this helps demonstrate that despite the fact that there is a criticism, and certainly organic should strive to minimize soil disturbance, it should continue to push technology and techniques that um, do allow for increasing no-till phases and increasing returns of biomass and, and diversity back into the soil, um, we're not seeing profound soil carbon losses. Um, and I do recognize that, that this does not address risk of tillage and cultivation with respect to surface erosion, um, but just wanted to point that out in terms of um, that criticism of organic. And we see this in other ex long term experiments as well. So, this is one from um, the uh, Middle Atlantic region, the Mid Atlantic region, where they're comparing a conventional no till system, um, a cover crop based system, and an organic system, again, looking at soil carbon. And in this case, you do see that there are different letters next to each of these numbers, which designate grams per kilograms of total soil carbon and organic tends to have more soil carbon than even the no conventional no-till and cover crop based systems. Um, and this is another project from the Mid-Atlantic region showing similar trends with no-till, chisel-till, and organic in terms of um, carbon to one meter soil depth and change in carbon um, where chisel-till is losing carbon versus where you see gains and no-till tends to be more to equilibrium. Uh, and then one more set of data um, from Iowa State University as well, their long-term system, again, you know, verifying those same trends where soil organic carbon here on the top line, organic versus conventional, um, organic is, is um, showing uh, better maintenance of soil carbon than conventional. So, Again, I, I realize this isn't addressing other aspects that we're concerned about with soil disturbance, but um, you know, we're certainly we're certainly not necessarily seeing um, the uh, some of the concerns that I know people are um, often discussing with organic. The other data point that may be of interest here is MBC microbial mass. And we're seeing higher levels of microbial biomass in organic as well as compared to conventional in the Iowa State University plots. Uh, so in the last portion of the talk today, um, in the last you know 15 minutes or so, I just want to talk a little bit about what we're doing with organic no-till, particularly with soybeans. And this is a technique that is being increasingly adopted 
um, by organic uh, grain farmers um, and, and farmers that are growing soybeans for dairy. I just had a pretty long conversation with a farmer that was doing some, some soybeans for his uh, organic dairy farm yesterday um, using organic no-till. Um, but in, at, I talked to farmers in Minnesota and Wisconsin and, and Iowa, and this is a technique that conventional farmers are increasingly interested in as well as another um, tool to help manage herbicide resistant weeds. So a lot of you may be familiar with this. Um, and again, these are you know, some of the criticisms that are rightfully um, uh, levied against uh, tillage based systems. So, you know, we not only have issues with um, surface erosion with tillage, uh, here's an example of, of that in cover crop based no-till um, with all that high residue si uh, sitting on the soil surface um, helps mitigate the risk of that. You know, the other aspect that the cover crop based no-till helps address is uh, water infiltration. And this is something that, that we see in, in different NRCS demonstrations. And the farmer I talked to yesterday, he actually said he was going organic no-till because of a talk that involved Ray Archuleta out in southwestern Wisconsin in the driftless, and then they did the water infiltration test, that rainfall simulator, and they had organic no-till, and they had other fields, and he was very, very impressed in how organic no-till um, performed in that rainfall simulator. But here we have a field where it's you know, been highly tilled. We don't see good water infiltration on the right, and this is something that definitely bears out in terms of experience. We see really good water infiltration with all that rye residue on the soil surface to help, help capture that rainfall, get it down the soil profile where we need it. This year, it's, it's been a blessing too um, to be farmers to get out in the field earlier. And I've seen some you know, really interesting social media posts of, of farmers that are in high cover crop systems that have um, been able to get in the fields when their neighbors have not been able to. So typically when we look at the system, um, we're looking at soybeans into a winter cereal, typically winter cereal rye. Um, we've tried it with winter wheat, winter triticale, doesn't work quite so well, um, but soybeans into winter cereal rye and is, is, is something that is, is pretty low risk if it's done right. And this is a field um, at our Arlington research site, and these are organic no-till beans. So there is rye underneath there. These are organic. These have not been cultivated. You can see how clean it is. The success of this is all dependent, although, or for a large part, very large part, dependent on achieving adequate rye biomass. And I'll, I'll talk about how to do that. Um, corn, unfortunately, we do not have an answer for corn yet, but we, um, we are keeping pushing that ahead. And again, with some of this new technology that's developing, through Dawn Equipment and McFarland's, and there's I, there's a whole host of companies that are looking into this um, uh, with different mowing and and you know looking at different closing wheels and and different ways of residue management. I, I do I'm still hopeful that we'll get corn figured out in organics with these high residue systems, um, high cover crop based systems. But for right now it's it's really soybeans that we're focused on. So we need to get a lot of biomass, um, about 10,000 pounds per acre. This is again our uh, Arlington Research Station. You can see how thick that rye mat is. This is actually, I think, the Dawn Roller crimper. So there's actually kind of those mini little crimpers that are directly mounted on the plant planter, but you can see just how how lovely um, of a, a mat that is that's protecting the soil and smothering weeds. Um, and essentially what we're doing in this organic system where we're not using herbicides is we're using this mulch the same way you'd use straw in your garden. So it's basically um, preventing sunlight from reaching the soil surface. So this is where the biomass is critical. We need to absolutely, if we're gonna keep weeds down, prevent sunlight from reaching the soil surface. And if you look at that mat and you see ground, you're gonna see a weed there. So you need to have that mat thick enough that you do not see soil. Um, yes, it's dry biomass value. I see a question pop up. Yeah, so that's dry matter. Um, I just, my technician just gave me our values for this year and we have um, between 12 and 14, it was just a banner year for us with rye biomass. Um, it really liked that cool weather being a cool season car crop um, this uh, past spring. So. 8,000 pounds dry matter, um, it is achievable. And, and we're continuing to push forward with tools to help predict that. 
because unfortunately one of the challenges in this system is it can be hard to anticipate in late April if you're going to get that but you need to make the call fairly early are you going to have enough especially in organic where you can't use herbicides is it enough or is it not enough because you don't want to go forward once that rye starts growing and getting into the boot stage it really can be hard to manage um, so we're trying to figure out ways that we can better um, predict whether that 8,000 pounds is going to be there earlier so that farmers can go to a plan but typically with the right agronomic steps, um, that is a definitely achievable biomass. Um, so what are the agronomic steps? So, and this is something that um, I hear farmers and advisors miss, um, it, it's, it's a misrecommendation. I, if for farmers just starting out with this, they don't know how the rye is going to respond on their field, I would absolutely push for three bushel an acre. I, I know that's a lot higher than the one bushel an acre that we typically recommend for a rye cover crop, but we we need that, especially the first couple of years of farmers doing this. If a farmer is able to get that biomass at a lower seeding rate, and I know farmers that you know do dial back to two and a half, two bushel an acre, that's great. They, they, if they can do it, that's wonderful. Save on the cost, but I would not do that right away. I'd go three bushel an acre. This is the keystone of a weed management program. It's not to dial back on the seed. You need to calibrate your drill, know the germination, so you're actually putting out three bushel an acre. The other absolute key in terms of agronomics to make this work is you need to plant this early. So again, this is not your typical rye cover crop. You're not gonna wait till October, November to plant this. And I know that rye will still germinate potentially in December, and that's all well and good. But for this application, because we need that early growth, we need the ability for that crop to tiller, just like we're doing when we're maximizing our wheat yields or our cereal grain yields, this is not a cover crop. This is a crop for our system in many ways, and we need to get that in um, between, you know, depending on what latitude you are in the upper Midwest, anywhere from early to mid-September into, you know, if you were in Iowa, you might be able to get away with um, uh, mid-October. It's kind of like in that same range where you, you're looking for ideal, like, wheat planting conditions, winter wheat planting conditions. It's kind of like in those same ranges of planting dates. Um, so for me at Arlington, I'm shooting for mid to late September to get this crop in. So I need to think of my rotation. How do I do this? I mean, I know you usually don't want to follow a cereal grain with a cereal grain, but because we're not letting this go all the way to grain production, um, in terms of a disease management standpoint, it's not as risky. So sometimes we do go in after a winter wheat or an oat crop and plant this to get in early enough. And our rotations, we try to pick an early maturing silage variety. And there are some really good genetics out there now um, that have some high performing earlier maturing varieties. Certainly I would look at some of that variety trial data that seed companies have out. It does take some strategy, um, but it is, is definitely worth it to reduce risk. Um, and this is just a photograph to, to show how much of a difference planting gates make. So these were taken by Stephen Mursky. These are from the Mid-Atlantic region again, but we see very, very similar dynamics. And we have some photographs too from Arlington that are, are just a little less regimented than this in terms of um, planting dates. But these are photographs that were taken in April. So this is what the crop looks like in the resulting um, spring. But you can see from an August 25th planting date to an October um, 15th planting date, how much different that crop looks. And you can, you can just anticipate how much that biomass is gonna be infected, and also how much more that these earlier planted crops are going to help suppress early weeds. Um, like common ragweed is one, for example, where before that rye really starts growing, we need this extra biomass to help suppress those earlier germinating weeds. Because once those weeds are germinated, even if it's roller crimped, those weeds are typically still gonna come up. So it's a combination of early weed suppression and, and ultimate biomass in this system but no doubt these are all the same seeding rates this is just um, a difference of fall planting dates um, there's common ragweed this is exactly this is something that if we don't have that stand we're going to see some of these weeds and these are not going to be taken out by roller crimping 
This was actually taken by colleagues at Cornell University. Crimper, there's more and more models now as both conventional and organic farmers are continuing to adopt this technique. This is a rear-mounted um, road ale design. Um, a lot of farmers have this, certainly can be effective. Typically is filled with water to allow extra weight in the system. Ours is often frontal mounted now. Um, benefit of front mounting is it can be done in a one pass operation versus two. Um, in this circumstance, you know what I might recommend a farmer do would actually be if they're going to do two pass, go through, actually plant first in standing rod and then crimp the whole thing um, on the same day. And I think that it'd be easier not only to see where they planted, but to get the seed in the ground versus try to plant over into that mat. So there's various ways you can do this, um, various crimpers you can use. Uh, Dawn equipment, these are these little mini rollers that we've been experimenting with um, that have worked well. Rodale, um, plans are on the Rodale website. If a farmer, I know farmers often just bring them to a local you know, machine fabricator and, and get them built locally. I've heard farmers do a cultipacker and just do what they have on their farm too. Um, but they're not necessarily gonna get the weight or down pressure. Um, the other key agronomic factor is that it needs to be terminated in a thesis at flowering, um, and that's where you're going to get the effective control or termination of the crop. So you can't push it too early. You have to wait for the thesis, which typically for us occurs between like Memorial Day and the first week of June. These are some of our yields that we've gotten um, on the uh, left-hand side. These are tilled soybean yields. On the right-hand side, these are cover crop-based no-till yields. Um, you know, the first few years, we do see more of a yield drag. I can, I can attribute that to a learning curve on our part, but in more recent years, they've been pretty on par, kind of bouncing back and forth. Um, you know, sometimes tills pull ahead a little bit better, sometimes no-till does a little bit better, but typically um, right on par at, you know, about, you know, anywhere from 50 to 60 bushel an acre. Um, looking at the economics um, of the system, uh, this is outlining some of the different costs. Um, so no-till right now, we are still seeing a little bit of a yield drag in this example can vary, so there's a three bushel an acre difference. These are some real numbers from our research station. Um, we are um, you know, looking at costs of cultivating versus the cost of the cover crop seed and planting the cover crop. Um, you know, the, the returns right now are a bit less, about $25 per acre less on the no-till. And a lot of that is um, due to the cover crop seed cost um, that's bringing it down. So if a farmer is able to save their own seed or um, if there's looking at bring that cost down. We're also looking at planter technology where we're hoping to not have to plant at so high a rate and still get the stands that we're looking for um, that should not only bring the seed cost down but also bring the um, yields up. But again, um, when we look at kind of the, the bigger picture, long game of organic, um, again, just give the example the farmer I was just talking to yesterday as I was um, uh, uh, talking about um, his motivation for doing organic no-till. And he said, you know, his biggest motivation was honestly that he was not only, he, he gave that example of, you know, being inspired by Ray Archuleta at that field day, but also that this excited him because once these soybeans are planted, the management is done until harvest um, in, a t in a typical situation. So he didn't have to worry about trying to get out and do weed management during an already busy season. Um, so the, the fact that there was a bit of a trade-off here um, was uh, acceptable to him in, in that circumstance because uh, of the time factor. Some examples of our fields, um, you can see this beautiful rye mound and clean that is. So this is organic, no herbicides, no additional weed management. Once it was crimped, planted, it's left to go. Um, this is a photo right before combining that. Um, so you can see we this, so the combine just goes right over the mat. There's no issues with harvest. Um, combine, combining no-till 
cover crop based soybeans. Um, increasingly, farmers are doing interseeding, including drilling um, soybeans with spring planted cereal rye because that rye doesn't vernalize. Um, it stays as a, basically a, a low growing interseeded cover crop, and this can reduce the need for tillage and cultivation as well as protect the soil early on in soybean growth. So, this has been something we're increasingly seeing. Um, those again, these are actually not tilled and cultivated, or just are not cultivated. This has cereal rye interseeded with the soybeans, and that is enough. And you can see where this vegetative cereal rye grows about six inches um, on this right hand side. You can see where it dies back into a killed mulch. Um, this is the farmer didn't do any other soil disturbance or cultivation after planting both the cereal rye um, and the in the spring with the soybeans. Um, that was his entire weed management program. Um, another field where that same technique was done, cereal rye interseeded with um, soybeans in the spring, um, and that took care of all the weed management for those organic beans. But this is a higher risk system. I'm seeing farmers using it increasingly, um, but we definitely need more research to understand how to reduce risk in the system and maximize success. Um, another photo of the same thing. It's just amazing to me when this does work, how beautiful it, it is. Um, a question about allelopathy in rye and soybeans. No, we, we, I, I just don't see that. Um, it was, I know that is, is an impact with other, or effect with other crops, but um, soybeans, if it is, if soybeans are impacted, it seems to be minimal. Um, and this is my last slide, just to show again, highlighting some of the work we're doing with interseeding with corn. This is a, a red clover cover crop into organic corn. Um, so we're doing a lot of research with different interseeding equipment, different um, planting densities of corn to maximize cover crop growth between rows, um, variety selection, and then um, corn architecture to maximize cover crop growth to, to better accommodate and be successful with these intensive cover crop systems. So with that, we're right at an hour, but um, that's all I have. So I can pass it back to Caleb if I can figure out how to do that. And I can do it too okay. if it helps. Did you? I think I just gave it to Caleb, but okay, I'm happy great. to answer any questions in the last minute or so remaining. And we can go over a little bit too as well. Thanks, Erin, that was great information. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions out there. So while we're waiting um, for people to either unmute themselves, now you can talk, or send it through the chat line. I was just gonna mention that I sent out the CEU, uh, my email before, so if you wanna get a CEU credit for today, just send me an email. Um, and this is being recorded, so I will post it as soon as we can get it um, loaded and convert it over. And I just sent out a link for a short evaluation for the training. And Caleb is back. Um, so Caleb, if you wanna start talking and people can still free to send us some questions if you have any. Thank you, Penny, and thank you, Aaron. That was really informative. I just wanted to make a plug for future uh, trainings. Uh, on July 30th, we are hosting uh, Karen Jokla, who is the Farm Bill Pollinator Conservation Planner with uh, Minnesota Xerxes Society on July 30th. And on August 28th, uh, we are working with small organic farming operations with uh, Ka Yang Vang uh, from Dunn County NRCS and Valerie Dantoin, who is an instructor in organic agriculture at Northeast Wisconsin Technical College. And with that, thank you very much for joining us and we will see you in a month. Right, and I do have more like the agendas and everything for these trainings um, on the Wisconsin Land and Water website. So be sure to check that out too. And you can find out a little bit more about these trainings and some other ones that are being offered. Have a great day, everyone. And thanks Aaron again and Caleb for putting this together. <laughs>